So good morning. Is it working the microphone or yes, no? Okay, so good morning. So we start. Uh, okay, I hear some some echo. Have to mute uh, your computer, otherwise you will have echoes here. Yeah, so we will start with the first uh, presentation from Tanya Melschweber. The uh, talk is about <coughs> non-equilibrium dynamics and nanofriction in ion Coulomb crystals. Um, Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so yeah, good morning. Uh, welcome to the new day. And I have the honor to be the first speaker. And it's also actually my first day on the conference. I apologize, I'm late. Uh, there were some unfortunate other coalitions coming in that were so important that I had to come later. I apologize very much. But uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. It's the first time, and it's a wonderful place. I'm absolutely amazed. Um, yeah, so my name is Tane Milchstobler. I'm from PTB. I hope the power... Hey, hey. Struggling with this laser. So I'm from PTB. That's the National Metrology Institute of Germany. So National Metrology Institute means that uh, we're actually building atomic clocks. So I'm from the time and frequency community, so I understand I'm a, maybe a little bit the alien on this conference. And uh, our group uh, is called Quantum Clocks and Complex Systems. Uh, why? Because uh, we are building novel atomic clocks based on complex cooler crystals. Yeah? Mixed species crystals, 1D, 2D crystals. We're heading towards entangled clocks, cascaded clocks. Uh, so I can teach you everything about atomic clocks, uh, but here in terms of nanofriction, I'm here to learn from you. Yeah. And uh, we have five working groups, um, the multi-ion clock, precision spectroscopy, where we're testing Einstein's general relativity, doing fundamental tests. Um, we're also doing a lot of uh, technology projects, uh, building integrated ion traps with nanophotonics, also a lot of industry projects, outreach and quantum technologies. But a very important part is uh, to really understand the dynamics of ion cooler crystals. So um, while I was building the atomic clocks, I got interested in what are these creatures, these ion cooler crystals, how do they behave, what is their dynamics, and I wanted to understand it. And this is what this talk will be about. Um, so what all our projects share is the work with trapped ions. So I just would like to uh, introduce a little bit ions for those who are not familiar yet. Uh, with trapped ions. So here you see a picture of a single trapped terbium ion in our experiment. So this is progressing on the monitor screen here. Uh, ions are typically trapped in these kind of ion traps. Uh, they also look rather complex and evolved. Uh, so they have to be ultra high vacuum proof. Uh, you have to put like 1000 volts of, uh, uh, of, of voltage here. You drive them and you drive them here with this spondromotive potential. Uh, Stop, you see? So an RF ion trap, a Paul trap, which was invented by Wolfgang Paul, is basically shaking the electric potential faster than the inert mass of the ion allows it to leave the trap. Yeah? While the ion is trying to leave, uh, it's always seeing this changing saddle potential. And on a time average, it's staying, and it sees actually a perfect harmonic oscillator. And uh, why is this uh, harmonic oscillator so perfect? Because it's very deep. It's like uh, 10 thousands of Kelvin deep. Yeah, like this, we have trapping times of an ion, and such a harmonic oscillator will stay for several weeks up to months. Yeah? And uh, that means the anharmonicities are very small, uh, so we have this very perfect uh, uh, yeah, uh, parabola trap with uh, uh, quantized states of motion. So we can do really uh, very applied uh, yeah, quantum mechanics with our atomic system. Uh, we can uh, couple uh, with a laser to the pseudospin of the ion and uh, excite it, fluoresce it. Uh, but we can also um, excite and engineer the bosonic uh, degrees of freedom, the motion. And we can couple the fermion with the bosonic degree of freedom. This is how you do quantum gates, how you, do build, uh, how you build quantum computers based on trapped ions. So it's a very powerful system, and uh, we do laser cooling. We can bring everything to the millikelvin regime, so we freeze out pretty much all the motion. Uh, 
at the very end, uh, this is uh, rather tedious, but at the very end, uh, we can also uh, cool the ion to the quantum mechanical ground state. Yeah? So, and then we know really the position of the ion within a few nanometers and this uh, quantum mechanical wave function. And for this reason, because everything is under such a high control, atomic clocks based on trapped ions actually have the world record currently for atomic clocks. So they're reaching just barely now at the 10 to minus 19 level. So 19 digits after the comma. But uh, I promised to speak about cooler crystals now in this talk. So uh, not about optical clocks. So let's start with the dynamics of cooler crystals. This is not a crystal yet. This is a, a, a liquid. So it's a self-organized system of when you put many ions in such an ion trap, it's very nonlinear with the Coulomb interaction, uh, very chaotic dynamics. Uh, and this is happening when the kinetic energy is larger than the potential energy. Then we have kind of a liquid phase. It was very nice detailed by Dubin and O'Neill in the 90s. Here you can find all the different regimes. We are working in a strongly correlated regime. That means uh, temperature needs to be below three Kelvin when we have something like one ion per cubic uh, tens of a few micrometer. So that depends on the, the density of the crystal. Uh, if we increase uh, this uh, gamma coefficient, uh, giving us the correlation, so uh, above one, it's basically in the liquid phase. This is already the strongly correlated regime where you will see strong correlations here from ion to ion. But if you cool even further and increase this uh, gamma parameter, then the cooler crystals freeze out. And then you see these beautiful pictures of ion crystals. Here is the potential energy then uh, larger than the kinetic energy, and the ions can't hop anymore from lattice side to lattice side. That happens typically if the temperature is below 20 millikelvin. And there you have the different phases, 1D, 2D, 3D phases. Here in the 1D phase, we even reach temperatures of something like 1 millikelvin. We can cool the crystal even better. And uh, I also want to point out everything what I'm presenting here in this talk is based on ytterbium ions. So everything what you see here fluorescing in blue are the ytterbium ions. Well, uh, we're not only interested in the phases and in the static dynamics, but we were interested what happens when ions are changing, when the crystal is changing the phase, yeah, the non-equilibrium dynamics. Um, to recap here, you have this, uh, three different phases, one, two, three D, and we can control them with our ion trap by setting the aspect ratio of the trapping potential right. So the uh, control parameter alpha is basically the ratio between the radial confinement and the axial confinement. And depending how we squeeze or relax our ion trap, we can set 1D, 2D, and 3D phases at, as the ground state of lowest potential energy. And yeah, we're asking ourselves what happens if we change now from one phase to the other phase in a fast way. Uh, this is, of course, very well known to you, especially in, I mean, in, in solid state physics. This is a, a thing that uh, you are investigating, second order phase transitions. Yeah, it's, it's very uh, universal dynamics, so you find it in so many um, uh, subjects, like in ferromagnets and metal superconductors. And even in the early universe, uh, Phase transitions happen, symmetry breaking happened, so uh, you know all the Higgs field. And actually, this is exactly the type of potential landscape you also have in ion traps. Because on one side, you have here uh, the two dimensional potential when a cooler crystal is going from linear to zigzag, then you have basically such a type of symmetry breaking with a double well potential forming. But if you take the third degree of freedom, the rotational degree, yeah, uh, the, the iron crystal can rotate and you basically get even such a goldstone mode. <laughs> so it's quite funny, it's the same symmetry. And that's why it was proposed in uh, 2008 uh, uh, by Fishman and Morici. Uh, they were looking at this phase transition from linear to zigzag, so where you break the rotational symmetry of such a, a potential landscape and you go to a, a mirror symmetry with a double well. Um, they uh, calculated that in a thermodynamic limit, uh, solved the Ginzburg-Landau coefficient, and, and found that this is in fact a second order phase transition for really large cooler crystals. So the idea came up, what happens if you uh, undergo this phase transition in a very fast, non-adiabatic way? Is it possible to uh, form defects? 
Uh, that was uh, proposed by Adel Adolfo del Campo in 2010 uh, to use the system as a test for kippel zurich dynamics. Uh, we did this, and within a given time frame in this talk, I will not go into the kippel uh, zurich uh, thing anymore, because I want to speak about nanofriction here. But this is how we started out. We wanted to test uh, kippel zurich dynamics. That was in 2012, 2013. Here I just would like to recap um, how we produce topological defects. Um, because it's a very strange system, it's not a large system, it's not a thermodynamic limit, uh, and it's an inhomogeneous system. Yeah? You have a finite system, a parabolic uh, trap. So when you undergo uh, such a phase transition and you do a fast quench from linear to zigzag, the phase transition actually starts out in the center of the cooler crystal where you have the highest cooler density, and then the phase front spreads out over the crystal. And when you do this uh, quench faster than the speed of this phase front, then the ions can't communicate with each other, can't talk to each other, so you're faster than the speed of sound in the cooler crystal, and then you possibly can create defects. At that time, in 2010, nobody had seen that, and it was heavily debated if it's possible at all, given that you have micromotion and very complicated dynamic in, in, in cooler crystals. So we did this in our experiment in 2013, we published that. Um, so we did this very fast quenches, uh, fast means a few microseconds, uh, undergoing this uh, criticality. I will not go in experimental details, don't worry. But what we obtained in the end were indeed topological defects, so kink solitons. In a very finite system, fair enough, uh, we see different types of defects, localized defects, extended defects, again, uh, uh, depending on our trapping parameter. And what do we mean with a defect? So if you look, for instance, in brown kifscha the frankel kontorova model, uh, it's basically a, a linear chain, and you just map it uh, so that you take every other ion, like uh, uh, if an uh, ion has an odd place, uh, you map this, uh, order parameter. So A is basically the distance from the linear nodal line, how far the ions buckle out from this uh, linear line. This is the parameter A. And you see it can be positive, negative, positive, negative. This is when the zigzag forms. So you take every other ion and you multiply it with minus I to the power of K. K is the number of the ions, so you make positive, uh, every even one becomes positive, every odd one becomes negative. So this is how you define this discrete uh, field phi, and then you see even such a, a zigzag chain becomes nothing else but a linear field phi, um, where you can uh, define the order parameter here, which is like plus one on this side. And when you undergo this defect, you see the cooler crystal is changing from zigzag to zigzag. And here in the center, it doesn't match anymore. Here you have a collisional a domain wall forming, and then the field becomes negative. So these are the two different orientations, basically, in this potential that you can roll either to the left or to the right side. I know I'm preaching to the choir, you know all that, but this is how it looks in iron cooler crystals. And uh, yeah, why we call this uh, topological solitons, or why theorists call it topological solitons, obeying uh, this uh, Lagrangian of the phi to the four model. Well, it's, it's really, despite being a very finite system and the kink for sure can leave in the boundary uh, effects, but nevertheless, just by looking at the boundary effects, you know if a kink is present or not, if the cooler crystal has flipped or not. And you can't destroy it locally. You can't deform the field locally and get rid of the kink. I mean, two kinks can annihilate, but one is stable and stays. So you can only leave it at the finite boundary effect. And actually, this is something that I saw in the experiment when we did many uh, topological defects. I saw such a picture from uh, the ions in the chain when you have maybe some background collision, some hydrogen particle flying by, giving a bit of extra kinetic energy. And then uh, I saw that uh, uh, the cooler crystal was still stable and localized on one side, but uh, the topological defect that was present here was actually leaving the crystal to the left side. And you really can see how the ions are sliding on top of each other. So that was very beautiful, and that gave me the idea, um, I mean, a part of studying phase transitions and pass Navarro barriers of different uh, kink realizations, can we also possibly do nanofriction in such a system? It's a self-organized system, so we don't have any constraint from outside. 
Um, so, of course, here, I, this I will not tell you because it's teaching to the choir. Um, I mean, we are looking, of course, here in our many body system uh, to the Frankel Kontorova model. So, uh, our ion chain is very strongly coupled by long range interactions. And, of course, we're interested in a regime uh, where something interesting happens. So, incommensurate regime, where basically the distance between the ions on one row is different than the distance, uh, the periodicity of this corrugation potential. So can we see something like super lubricity, what uh, Aubry and Perat predicted in 1983? And uh, yes, there have been many interesting proposals also coming from uh, these groups here uh, that inspired us. So uh, mainly in 2011, the papers by Benassia and Puttivarasin inspired us that uh, proposed to use actually iron cooler crystals, linear strings of cooler crystals to study nanofriction they proposed to put a, a cavity around this cooler crystals to have a corrugation potential, so a standing uh, optical lattice, and then uh, uh, do uh, frankel kontorova physics with it. Um, well, we are uh, clock metrologists. We don't want to put uh, a cavity next to our iron traps because that would disturb very much our atomic clock. Um, so I will show you we will, how we try to do it differently. But first of all, what have you predicted, basically? What should be the observables of uh, yeah, uh, the types of nanofriction? The first thing that was predicted in these papers um, was the symmetry breaking in a finite chain that uh, in, uh, at such a pinning to sliding kind of uh, Aubrey type transition. In a finite system, you should see a symmetry breaking. And you should see the vanishing of a vibrational soft mode when you undergo the criticality. In an infinite system, it would stay in a sliding regime. In a finite system, actually, it would come up again and take on a finite value. So this is what we would expect to have. And uh, as you know, uh, in, in MIT, in Blood and Wilditch's group, these types of experiments have been implemented very successfully and beautiful papers came out. And Vladan was doing that in parallel to our endeavors at uh, PTP. Uh, in the beginning, we didn't know of each other, but Vladan was really uh, basically taking uh, your suggestion, putting this uh, uh, cavity around this linear chains that gives him a lot of degrees of freedom and, and seeing the onset of the Aubrey transition in the system. We do it differently. Uh, as I said, we do not have a cavity. Uh, we're taking just a two-dimensional cooler crystal with our topological defect. So um, we didn't want to install anything in our chamber, but we were able to produce topological defects, and we have seen them sliding. So we cool uh, two-dimensional cooler crystals to the level of a millikelvin. We have an imaging system with a spatial resolution of down to uh, 40 nanometers, where we can really detect the position of the ions. And our idea was, uh, can't we use somehow the back action and the self-interaction between the ions, basically giving us the corrugation potential? Because ions are charged particles, so if you have a, a, a zigzag of ions, uh, two chains on top of each other, you can think of it, of the cooler interaction in the vertical direction as giving you the corrugation potential of the other chain. So the top chain would basically sense the corrugation potential of the other chain. And vice versa, it's a back acting system. So the idea was if we bring these two chains closer and closer together, so basically enhancing the cooler interaction in the vertical uh, uh, direction, increasing this corrugation potential, we should also see some point of criticality. So we did some very simple mathematics as experimental physicists do it. Um, so basically we were looking at the interaction strength uh, of the ions along the chain, uh, given by the D parameter here and the actual confinement and the inter-ion interaction uh, between the chains. So uh, our control parameter is basically then the ratio between the radial trapping frequency and the actual trapping frequency, which is again something like the trap aspect ratio. Now I come to the experimental observations, uh, what we have seen. Uh, these are now actual pictures of our, so photos from our ions. Uh, so no simulation, but photos. We have thought about how can we um, define an order parameter phi that would uh, basically show us the symmetry breaking. And we basically measure the relative distance uh, from one ion in one layer to the other ion in the other ion to the other layer. So we always took uh, ions from layer one uh, with respect to layer two and we measured the axial C distance. So always the next neighbor interaction. 
uh, and summarized over these uh, delta Cs from neighboring ions uh, along the whole chain here. This is the order parameter. And when we plot it, when we evaluate this data here, so the red points are our experimental measurements, then we see that the cooler crystal stays actually beautifully symmetric up to a certain point, alpha, this is this control parameter, the trap aspect ratio, given, shown here also by the red line. And once we cross the red line, actually the cooler crystal takes on a, a certain preferred symmetry. So the order parameter takes on a finite value. And uh, what do we see here in the experiment that's maybe a bit confusing in the beginning because you see different uh, types of realizations of the cooler crystal. You see here like three different types of realizations because uh, if you do an experiment, it takes a certain time to take the photo. It takes uh, yeah, a few milliseconds or no, uh, even longer, 40 milliseconds maybe. And if you have some finite uh, kinetic energy remaining, even at uh, one millikelvin, now, yeah, it's a zoom up here. Uh, so you get different realizations, the red one and the blue one. And why? Because look at the Paz Navarro potential. Look what happens at the symmetry breaking, uh, at this uh, Aubrey type transition. Uh, it's basically from sliding to pinning. This is uh, how you call it. Um, and well, don't be confused, the Paz Navarro uh, potential uh, of this uh, yeah, complex system of the collective excitation is. is, is um, globally confining. It's not a flat line like you, what you have in an infinite system. Because of the boundary effects, it's basically bending upwards. And uh, that's also the reason why this topological defect stays nicely confined in the center with the finite uh, oscillation mode. But then when you undergo this uh, criticality, the red line, you see that bumps, that barriers are forming in the pious Navarro potential. And this is uh, the reason for the pinning effect. But in the beginning, you also see that the barriers are very tiny. So in terms of millikelvin, in the beginning, they are sub one millikelvin. Of course, so they start from zero. And so if you have a tiny bit of thermal energy, uh, the system can hop from one uh, minimum to the other. This is basically the red realization and the blue realization. And when you take a photo with a long exposure time, you see both at the same time. This is what we have here. We also plotted the Hull function for our system. We evaluated it, and it's really what you expect that uh, when you cross criticality, the Hull function is uh, uh, fragmentating and becoming uh, non-monotonic uh, anymore, and you have actually different gaps because it's in a uh, homogeneous system, so the transition is uh, at different places at different times, also spatially resolved over this cooler crystal. It's quite intriguing. So uh, this, should show, uh, this was published in 2018, um, the analysis of the stick-slip motion in the system, how basically you have uh, different phases when you go spatially through such an inhomogeneous crystal and how you can explain the gaps of the Hull function. Uh, and then coming to the spectroscopic side, uh, so far nobody had ever observed such a sliding mode experimentally, uh, not that I am aware of at least. Um, so what we wanted to do is, I mean, this uh, sliding mode, uh, setting on the f transition from s sticking to sliding, um, must be something like a, a share, uh, a share mode. So basically, one chain is going to the left, the other chain is going to the right. They are sliding on top of each other. So we must impose uh, some differential light force with our laser. So we misaligned a focused laser, so to put a, a little bit of light force on one chain, which is stronger than on the other chain, so that we can uh, give some momentum. And we tickled uh, this uh, force by modulating the intensity to search for resonances, yeah, to have some uh, resonant excitation. And indeed, uh, when we're off resonant, this is how the cooler crystal looks. And if you hit the resonance, uh, it's very fragile because you have to go to very low uh, resonances, close to the criticality. Then you see actually that you can excite it. It was the very first time uh, that uh, people have seen uh, really the soft mode. And you know how it should look like. This is what theory predicts. Yeah, When you're coming from the pinned regime, as you predicted uh, in 2011, it should take on uh, from a finite value and go to zero at the uh, uh, pinning to sliding transition. And afterwards, because it's a finite system, it should come up again and take on a finite value. This is what a theory would predict for t equals zero. Uh, we did not see that, and we 
scratched our head what happens, uh, actually we saw something like this happening in our experiment. So the blue data is the experiment, but then we realized that having one millikelvin of temperature is really quite a lot of energy at uh, a critical point, of course, where everything becomes uh, uh, infinite or, or, and, and uh, vanishing. So we have very strong non-linearities at the point of criticality because of the finite temperature. Yeah, and if you model this, uh, the green line actually gives you exactly the prediction of what we have observed in the experiment. And again, the reason our explanation was the finite pot uh, barriers of the Pars Nevado potential make the system slide between the different first minima. There you see already that's a very unharmonic nonlinear system. And that prevents you from seeing this perfect uh, vanishing of the soft mode, yet at temperatures of uh, one millikelvin. You would really have to go to temperatures of uh, a few microkelvin to see this. Have really a more enhanced effect. But uh, that was everything very hand-waving, yeah? I mean, this is our intuitive understanding of this. And then, of course, we wanted to get more uh, clarity, and that's why I show you now in the remaining few minutes the follow-up work. This is now the summary of the nanofriction. So actually, we had uh, seen uh, the first onset of uh, symmetry breaking, non-analytic Hull function for the first time, and also the soft mode. But uh, we also realized you would have to go to a microkelvin to really uh, uh, see this uh, soft mode vanishing, or to even go quantum one day. Nevertheless, we have seen that uh, the breaking of the, uh, of the commensurability by a topological defect was reducing the friction, also static friction, by more than an order of magnitude in our system and really making the system slide much easier. And uh, we were very delighted to find that this is actually really similar to what also in biophysics was observed uh, here in simulations of DNA unfolding. When you have a, a kink, uh, basically a mismatch in the human DNA, then it also can slide and break earlier. So it's the same franco kontorova dynamics. Um, we emulated it with ions, but now we wanted to understand a little bit more the thermal effect. And uh, that's why I propose to first look at the linear to zigzag transition again, because it's easier to handle, also an experiment. So here uh, we also have the symmetry breaking where the system goes uh, into this two potential minima, and we should see also soft mode. Uh, we did this together with Haga Landa and Giovanna Morici. It was a very nice collaboration. Uh, we did again spectroscopy now on the linear to zigzag transition at the criticality. These are the phonons that you see here. This is like the breathing mode where you have one node, yeah, and the ions to the left go here, the ions to the right go there. This is the second phonon where you have two nodes and it's like an Egyptian mode. So you can basically excite the different collective phonons of the system with a laser beam. We did spectroscopy and uh, a lot of theory together with Giovanna and Hagai, um, and we saw that actually our experimental data and the theory can bring it to a match at the criticality if we uh, consider the temperature effect of the surrounding phonon valve. So if you're interested what happens at the criticality where the soft mode should vanish, uh, it's becoming everything very nonlinear, of course. Yeah? Uh, and this phonon can now, this mode can interact with a thermal phonon bath. So what we did is uh, we did a, a fourth order expansion of the cooler potential. And then we averaged over all higher lying phonons that are oscillating on a faster frequency and we can take a time average over them. So they give us a thermal background. It's kind of a Floquet uh, dynamics. And then uh, the phonons, the, the uh, low frequency phonons that are driving here the phase transition, they are seeing this modified cooler potential by the other phonons. This is basically described here. Um, we just look at the uh, phonon one and two. These are these very two lowest energy phonons. And then we see actually a change in the uh, frequency of these phonons in the, um, yeah, in the frequency spectrum, which depends on the temperature of the system. And this mathematical approach seems to work well and describe really what we see in experiment. In an intuitive point, you can also imagine that the system, while you go uh, undergo this uh, transition, uh, because of thermal fluctuations, uh, is still bouncing back and forth between the minima. So actually, the system stays more longer in a linear regime than it should before going out uh, and deciding to take on a symmetry uh, zigzag or zigzag. 
So it's actually more a crossover regime and not a sharp face transition, of course. Um, and this is also something uh, one should say because it was published in 2010 to be like a, a temperature-driven structural phase transition, but I think in our paper we showed it's really a crossover driven by temperature. You can't say that the criticality is shifted by temperature. Okay, now uh, I'm through with time. This is just the outlook. One day we also want to go quantum, but it's all about lowering temperature, going to the micro-Kelvin regime. And this is a very nice work that was also done by uh, Lars Tim, who is here in the conference. We wanted to show that tunneling is also possible in such a system over tens of micrometer, uh, which sounds very incredible in the beginning. But uh, we did basically a treatment of the collective system, defining the effective mass of the kink defect, which can become very small. Uh, so actually the kink can move a lot while the atoms are not moving at all. Uh, we solved the Hamiltonian and the wave equations for the system. So you see symmetric, anti-symmetric systems, and you really can see how they couple close to the Aubry transition, and you see tunneling effects. You can see how the phonon spectrum splits up even in the uh, quasi classic, uh, close to the quasi classic regime. Here's the tunneling regime where they interact already. We have seen tunneling motion, how the quantum kink can go back and forth. Uh, but this is, uh, I, I could give a whole talk about that. Um, I also should point out uh, Vladan Vuletic collaborated with Bonetti et al. Uh, he had a different treatment, but he also uh, could show quantum dynamics at this Aubrey phase transition. So I think that's very exciting. And in the future, we also will go towards energy transport through the topological defect. Again, nice work by Lars Tim, where our idea was to use the kink as a switch when you impact kinetic energy on one side, it will not arrive on the other side, depending whether you're in a sliding phase or in a pin phase. And with our control parameter, we can switch that on and off this effect. So with this, I'm at the end of my talk, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the, thank you for the fascinating talk. Uh, we have already over time, but I have one question, I would say. Out, uh, beautifully this uh, ions in different traps uh, so in different external potentials ring like uh, 3d 2d how flexible can you say those uh, potential what are the limitations uh, or is it patch potentials it <clears throat> patch potentials are the limitation uh, ions have many advantages, but at the same time make them a disadvantage, as, as usual in life. Yeah? There are always two aspects. Uh, so ions are charged particles. Uh, that's why we can trap them in this ion traps. Yeah? And maybe I, I show them quickly. Oops, it's very slow. The ion traps already look rather complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the beauty of this, we can control them so well, we localize them to 10 nanometers, we can uh, move them around with, uh, with all these uh, voltages that we apply here on the many electrodes. Uh, so it's a beautiful system, but at the same time, uh, being a charged particle makes you very sensitive to any electron sitting on a window or on an insulator on anything. So as soon as you're thinking of rather long spatially extended systems, you have to make sure that you control everything really to the nanovolt level. Mm -hmm. And that means you need many, many control electrodes to compensate things. And I mean, Hartmut Hefner was the first one in Berkeley to make a really a ring iron trap, where you have then this uh, very powerful geometry of having a, a quasi infinite system without the boundary condition. But the problem is you really need many, many control electrons to, to always compensate any slightest deviation in the field. It's a very fragile system, and it's a huge technological endeavor. And Hart, it took uh, almost 10 years, I think, for Hartmut to get this first trap, and it still can be improved. And so maybe in the future, yeah, I mean, we're working on iron trap technology at the same time, um, but it's really technical engineering. Yeah. Okay, so thank you again.